Normally for a game like Coco Life, I'd play a bunch of it, then write a review describing its features, strengths, and shortcomings. However, since this game isn't even in early access yet, and it's still very unfinished, it seemed kind of unfair to dissect it like that in its current state. So instead, let's check out my first 15 days in the game with commentary, and I'll summarize my current impressions, suggestions, and requests at the end. Please keep in mind that the game is subject to lots of change over the course of its development, so what you see here might not reflect the current state of the game whenever you're watching this video. Hi, future people! Also, a heads up, in parts of this video there is a mild photosensitivity warning. There are semi-frequent, brief, single flashes, starting in day 3. The first thing I always do when I try a new game is check out the settings. The devs have already warned me that the gamepad support is still only partial and a mouse is needed for some of the menus, and I'm pleased to see that they've also put a little note about that in the menu itself. Not every dev is so considerate. We've got a few basic settings, and I see you can already rebind all the keys, which is great. The game didn't detect my gamepad automatically when I loaded it, but it's easy enough to get it set up. However, there is one thing conspicuously absent from this menu. Sound options. There are no audio options of any kind, not even a simple volume slider. I need to point this out to you now, because this will have a big impact on the sound quality for the rest of this video. Normally, I record with the music off, but the sound on, then add back in the game's music during editing so it flows smoothly between cuts. I can't do that here, so unfortunately we'll all have to endure a lot of awkward sound cuts. It was that, or mute the whole game and just add music later, and I figure some of you want to know what the sound effects are like. We do what we can. The character creator is pretty simple for now, but I think the devs said they're planning to add more options in the future. I want to shout out the variety of options for black hair in there. In most games, white characters are the default, and they might add one black hairstyle in as an afterthought. But in this game, black hairstyles and darker skin tones have more options and actually look better. It's a nice change, to be honest. They also let you create your own colors by messing with the sliders, so I'm making a sickly green fungus boy with red hair. Story starts out pretty simply. I fell asleep on the train from somewhere to somewhere else and woke up in an isolated little village in the middle of the night. Fortunately, the innkeeper lets me use their spare room for free and I'm invited to stay for as long as I want. So I guess I live here now. Sure, why not? I sleep the night away on a futon and wake up the next morning. We've got a bit of standard tutorial intro here. There's a tree in the way, here's an axe, cut it up, and now you're free to explore the rest of the village. There's not much, just some trees and plants, a couple of houses with Nico the elephant and Tola the cow, and a locked workshop. Down on the beach there's a ton of trash, but we can't clean that up yet. There's a run button, which brings up a Breath of the Wild style stamina circle that goes down quickly, limiting how long you can run for. An odd choice for this type of game, if I'm honest. Anyway, back in the shop I learned that the village, or town, as the residents generously call it, used to have more people but they all moved away, and if I can fix it up, maybe they'll come back. I'm sent back to that workshop, now unlocked, and meet Sally. A few fetch quests and some boring drawn out dialogue later, and I've got some benches to place in the town. Mission accomplished. Oma, the innkeeper, sends me back down to the beach to tidy up that mess, easily done. It's nice to earn my keep. Then I'm sent back to the workshop to learn how to craft things at the workbench. As I'm gathering wood, I notice that there's no stamina meter. I can do as much work as I want per day with no limits. Cool. Anyway, I make a shovel and use it to plant some more trees. It's done Animal Crossing style. You dig a hole, then use the seed on it. No watering required. I'm also given the task of planting a bunch of different flowers so we can use them for decorations in the town. That's gonna take a while, so it looks like I'm gonna be left to my own devices for now. Let's go visit Moss the shopkeeper. Well, here's good news. Moss is willing to buy just about anything off me for cold, hard cash. They've, uh, got a guy. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, say no more. I spend some time chopping down all the trees in the forest and crafting planks, which I assume will earn me a profit, but it turns out that the planks don't sell for any more than their components, so I guess I should just sell the logs and save myself the effort. I'm able to clear the entire forest in short order, and I'm starting to realize just how slowly time passes in this game. These days are ridiculously long. The shop has a bug net in it, which I'm guessing is my key to big profits, but I can't afford it yet, despite selling pretty much everything I've picked up. What is there to do with my evening now that I've gathered and sold everything I can? I figure out that if I move really slowly, I can glide across the ground without moving my legs. Cool. Okay, now what? I don't really want to go to bed super early, but the days are so long in this game that at this point, I can't really think of anything else to do with my time. Day 3. Nico's got trash on their floor, which I guess it's my job to clean up. I'll send you a bill for my cleaning services later, Nico. The trees I've planted haven't grown yet, of course, but I noticed there are two trees next to the workshop which haven't been taken yet, so I grab those. 
But after heading to the beach to grab free shells and returning, I realize these two trees actually respawn after you leave the area and come back. Is it... Is it infinite wood? Don't mind if I do. Now, I'm not sure if this is intentional or a bug, but I don't see anyone stopping me from repeatedly cutting down the same trees to sell wood for enough gold coins to buy a bug net. I also discovered that the furniture placement controls on gamepad aren't nearly as good as on the keyboard. You can only rotate items 90 degrees with the controller, but with the mouse and keyboard you can fine-tune the angle. Lovely. Anyway, I get enough rupees for that bug net and start going hog wild. Here's where that photosensitivity warning comes in. Every time you catch a bug, there's a bright flash as though from a camera. Honestly, they need to add an option to disable that at some point, because it's really harsh on the eyes and will definitely be an accessibility issue. There's a collection mechanic, although it looks like there aren't too many different types of bugs in the game yet. I grab a handful of butterflies, which I assume will net me a lot more yen than just selling logs, and head back to the- Jesus, what the- Hey, Nico. Y you okay, buddy? Yeah, they're fine. Anyway, oh, hell yeah, that's the stuff. These butterflies sell for quite a bit considering how easy it is to run around catching bug after bug. They spawn in fairly quickly, sometimes right in front of my face. Time to rake in the big bucks. I remember to stop in at the inn around lunchtime, and sure enough, there's an outsider there, Benny. Benny also fell asleep on the train and woke up here. Benny is also sick of capitalism. Heck, Benny might consider moving here if we build them a house. My next purchase fueled with the corpses of butterflies is the pickaxe, which lets me break the big rocks in the forest for stone and coal. I have no idea if these will respawn, but presumably there must be some kind of infinite mining mechanic, either respawning rocks like an Animal Crossing or a mine like Stardew Valley and Harvest Moon and the like. I spend the rest of the day hunting butterflies so I can get rich. As I run around swinging my net at helpless bug after helpless bug, I consider the source of these countless little creatures. They don't spawn in off-screen like an Animal Crossing, they just phase into reality right before my eyes. I can only assume that they are multi-dimensional beings who can enter and leave our reality at will. The denizens of the butterfly dimension must have noticed that anyone who comes to this universe disappears forever, so I can only assume that they are volunteering to be caught so I can get rich. It's all very ethical. In the evening, I head back to the inn where another stranger awaits, and this one's a pig. There's two things I know about pigs. They're one, very intelligent, and two, capitalists. Sure enough, Rosa wants to set up a real estate agency so we can build and sell more houses and get more people to move here. Because that's what was preventing people from moving here. We didn't have a real estate agent to sell the land. Everyone was sitting around here going, Shoot, golly gee, if only we had a licensed realtor, we could let more people live here. But without someone to sell the land and the houses, it's physically impossible to build them. Our beautiful coniferous utopia just plum doesn't have the economy. Anyway, I tell her to go ahead and set up shop, which seems like it'll take a few days, but honestly, it is wild to me that the game's developers were like, hmm, what's needed to create homes in a forest? A builder? An engineer? No, a real estate agent, obviously. Before heading to bed, I do some more evening hunting. I'm curious whether different bugs will come out at night, but it doesn't seem that way. In any case, within a single day, I've managed to purchase the bug net, the pick, and the first backpack upgrade, so getting money seems pretty easy. Of course, a day is apparently about an hour long, which is a lot of time to cut down infinite trees and catch interdimensional insects. I honestly think that the days could easily be half as long and still have plenty of time for everything you want to do in a day. Day 4 is a rainy day. The lighting effects are nice, but we don't see any actual raindrops, which is fine. The real estate office is still under construction, so I go say hi to the neighbors. I get my first village request, delivering something from Tola to Nico, next door. I'm not sure if I should check in with Tola afterwards, so I'll just pop in and... Uh... You know what, let's, uh... Let's give Tola their privacy. Anyway, I got a jacket as a thank you for the delivery. I'm not sure it suits me, but it does seem more appropriate to the rainy weather. On the beach, I meet Deris, the homeless fisher bear. Deris suggests I go fishing, and gives me a crafting recipe for a pole. All I need is... Oh. Grass tufts. Which I've sold. Guess I'll have to wait till the grass grows back. A full day of bug hunting it is. Actually, I'm not feeling the jacket. Back to the t-shirt. I'm tough. I can handle the rainy weather. The beach seems to be the most profitable bug hunting grounds. These Dukes of Burgundy sell for 20 gil each, and I can get a lot of them pretty quickly by just running back and forth. I easily have enough for the next bag upgrade by the end of the day, but I decide to hold off on buying it. That realtor's office should open soon, and I'm not sure how much it will cost me to buy a house. 
On day five, the grass is regrown so I can finally make a fishing rod and catch some hapless underwater creatures, which I can then presumably sell. The fishing mechanic is different from what I've seen in other games. Similarly to Animal Crossing, you have to cast the line where a fish can see it, but they move around enough that even if you miss, if you wait a minute, it'll usually turn around and grab the bait. When a fish bites, you hit A to reel it in, but that opens a smaller minigame. It's not difficult, but it takes a bit of time and can be a little tedious. Basically, it's a lot of effort to catch a fish. Darius also says I can attach a bait to my pole in my inventory to make fishing easier, but I can't find any way to do that. Maybe worms don't work as bait, or maybe this is something that you can only do with a mouse and keyboard. I was never able to figure it out, so if you know the answer, leave the explanation in the comments, please. I want to sell my fish, but those flowers I planted the other day have also bloomed, so Moss sets me to work decorating the town first. Because who else would you trust to manage your town other than the random stranger who came here by accident, and who, for some reason, no one has come looking for? No, no one's come looking for me, right? You'd tell me if they had. Right? Anyway, with all the effort it takes to catch a fish, I assume they will sell for a lot of doubloons, but alas, they don't really sell for any more than the butterflies. So basically, much like in Animal Crossing, fishing is tedious and basically useless other than to fill in the collections, unless you enjoy the minigame, I suppose. I've also been asked by Oma to repair a stool, and now we get our first look at the design system. This system is borderline unusable on a gamepad, and kinda wonky even on a mouse and keyboard. You have to switch between modes to move, resize, and rotate pieces, and you have to actually click the little arrows that appear. But once you get used to the controls, I can see how the system could be used for making all sorts of cool stuff. And in fact, I'm immediately invited to try making my own furniture. It takes me ages, but I create a son. Stoolman. Unfortunately, you can't actually sit on him because he's just a decorate object and not a seat. I'll have to buy the blueprints for the other types of furniture later. When I finally finished making him, I realized that time was passing in the game the whole time I was working. This is fine, since the days are way too long anyway, but if time is passing, I'd like to see a clock in the design menu. First I take Stoolman to the beach so he can enjoy the sounds of the ocean, then head back to Sally and buy a bunch of different plans and recipes. All those euros I earned catching bugs disappear pretty quickly. Back to work zapping the interdimensional butterflies out of the air, I guess. Back at the shop, Moss explains to me how to plant seeds, which is something I had to figure out on my own several days ago. Thanks, Moss. Let's just put Stoolman somewhere everyone can appreciate him. Here we go. He can greet all the newcomers as they arrive. Good boy. One of the recipes I bought was for a bridge, which I suppose means I can cross the river now and explore the rest of the forest. It's super fiddly trying to make a bridge, though. The designer lets you place items at the very edge of the building area, but then part of the object is out of bounds, and it won't let you save it. By the time I finally make something acceptable, it's late at night, so exploring has to wait for the morning. And the morning brings adventure. Naturally, I indulge my darkest colonialist impulses and strip this new area for its natural resources. I'll plant more trees later. I will! Promise. The new area is bigger than the initial one, but not huge. There seem to be more places to explore off to the sides, but since my frail human body lacks the ability to jump or take a big step up, I can't get there. I do a bit more fishing and catch some more bugs. The new area spawns lots of butterflies, so that's handy. I also notice that every time I cross this bridge, it gives me a prompt to move it. While it's great that we can move stuff around at will, the button prompt kind of kills the immersion a bit. I'd like to see a construction mode of some sort added later, so we can keep that ability without crowding the screen with constant button prompts. There's another newcomer at the inn, another pig who seems to have some self-esteem problems. I invite them to live here, but they point out that there are no homes. Fair enough. I've noticed that you can copy things you've made in the designer, but I can't find a way to save a blueprint to do it without having the item in my inventory, so I have to literally pick up the bridge and carry it with me to the workshop to make another one. I also figure I can probably build something to get me up on that ledge, so make a few little ramps. They... do not work. Guess I'll sell them- Gah! Hey there, Tola. You playing hide and seek, buddy? Anyway, I go to sell the ramps and notice that they sell for a little more than the cost of their materials. Not a lot more, but still. I smell profits. Let's head back to the workshop and- Oh. I guess Tola found a better hiding spot. Let's head back to the workshop and see if we can game the system for fun and profit. But first, fishing. Darius the homeless fisher bear has a challenge for me. Catch five fish in five minutes. 
A minute per fish is actually not a lot given the complex minigame, but I managed to do it. Looks like the challenge doesn't end until the timer runs out though, even if you complete it, so I have to stand around until the clock hits zero before I get my reward. How much of a reward is it? I actually have no idea. It doesn't tell me, and I wasn't paying attention to how much money I had beforehand. I spend the rest of the evening catching more butterflies and pondering how I might get up on that ledge. On day seven, the real estate office is open, and Rosa the capitalist pig is waiting inside. Looks like I need to not only pay for the houses, I need to gather materials as well, and there's only one house type I can easily get the materials for now. I'd really like the little round one, but that requires red wood, which is something I haven't seen yet. So instead, I designate a spot for the new boring rectangular house, which is going to take a few days to build. Of course it is. A few hours of hunting bugs later, and I decide to investigate the exploitative possibilities of the design system. I make two items, literally a stick and poly the plank of wood, and sell them. A log normally sells for one bell, but an item made from one log sells for two. A plank normally sells for three, and an item made from a plank sells for four. It's only a profit of one dollar per item, but still, it's free money. Anyway, I've been thinking about my ledge problem, and I think I have a solution. You can't walk up a decorative item, but you can walk up a bridge. So if I make a bridge that's basically just a ramp up to the level of the ledge, it should get me up there, right? False. Incorrect. Doesn't work. I'd try a few other tweaks in the design, but at every turn I'm prevented from getting up to the top of the ledge. I guess this isn't how I'm supposed to do it after all. But I see trees and butterflies and such up there, so I'm hoping I will get a way up eventually. I spend most of the rest of the day catching bugs at- Nico? Dude, how the hell did you get up there? Seriously! Show me your secrets, you sorceress purple probosidian! I hunt bugs for a while to pass the time, then head back to Moss to- Wait, what's this? The plank ramp sells for a hundred quid? That's literally just three planks. That's nine pounds worth of materials. Surely this isn't intentional. Surely the game developers just forgot to adjust the bridge recipe by material value, because I can make a bridge out of two sticks. And I have infinite wood. Okay, let's take a beat and remember that this is a pre-early access game and plenty of stuff is still unbalanced. This is obviously not something that will make it into the final game, which is why I need to exploit it now and make infinite money before they take it out. I could keep going, but after I've bought every single item in Sally's design shop, what's the point? Visiting my neighbors the morning of day eight, Nico mentions something about hanging out in a mine. All right, Nico, we know you know all the secrets of teleporting around our little village here and getting to places that haven't been revealed to me yet. You don't need to rub it in. All the trees I planted a while ago have grown, and honestly, they make it hard to see, so I'm cutting them all down. What will I do with all this wood? Just kidding, I'm obviously going to turn it into obscene amounts of currency. In fact, better hit the infinite trees a few times as well. Oh, yes. Oh, hell yes. Well, I'm set for life, I guess. Now what? Might as well take Stoolman in for a little tune-up. This boy needs a face. There we go. My little boy has all grown up and become Woodman. I'm so proud. I'm not sure what else to do at this point. I'm basically just waiting for that house to be built. No one else seems to have any story or quests for me, and there's definitely no point to catching bugs anymore now that I have infinite moolah. I decide to spend the rest of the day digging up all the grass and flowers in the main forest area and replanting them somewhere out of the way. That's better. At this point, I'm pretty much just waiting for that house to finish getting built, since it seems like nothing's gonna happen until it does. I could make some more art or something, but I want to make progress, so I basically go right back to bed on day 9. On day 10, the house is built, but it needs a bed and a light source before someone can live there. I have recipes for those things, but I don't have the materials to make a light source. There's a bed for sale in the shop, so I just buy that, but there are no light sources around, and the recipe requires four bulbs to complete, and unfortunately, I don't know how to make those. I tried digging up sand to make glass, which is surprisingly tedious. You'd think sand would be easy to find on the, um, beach, but it takes me in-game hours to get the six sand required for one pane of glass. But glass doesn't seem to be the missing ingredient anyway. I guess I just need to sleep through the days until a light source appears in the shop. I also discover that those white rocks on the beach can be broken with the pick for chalk and stone, but that doesn't help either. On day 11, Tola asks me for a light source as well. Give me a break, Tola. I clearly don't have access to whatever materials are needed to make bulbs. You don't have to rub it in. 
I discovered that those white rocks on the beach do respawn, which is cool. The gray forest rocks have not respawned, though, so I'm out of luck there. While I'm waiting for a light to appear in the shop, I figure I'll designate a new house to be built. How about a beach house? I duck into the workshop to see if I can find out what materials are needed to make bulbs, but unfortunately the game seems to have glitched out and it isn't showing me the materials. Brilliant. Days 12 and 13, nothing much happens. I pretty much do a lap of the village and go straight back to bed. But on day 14, my luck changes at last. Could it be? An indoor light source. Huzzah! And for the low, low cost of... free? I'll take 10! The house is finally inhabitable, and I'm given the choice of who to move in. Myself, or one of the two visitors who stopped by recently. I go for Benny the Bunny. Unfortunately, nothing else seems to change. The beach house is done as well, so I furnish that to make it my own. I realize I can make a futon without having to go to the designer, and I'm not picky about my bed. In the process, I also discover that the materials crafting menu is super buggy with the gamepad. Scrolling down the list with the left stick doesn't scroll the menu itself, so you have to use both the left and right sticks to look through the list. I'm sure this bug will be fixed before too long, though. Anyway, I'm a homeowner! I've got a mailbox and everything. Maybe something else will happen now? Like, I'll get away up that ledge? Or access to that mine I've heard so much about? Well, there's a computer in the shop now that will let me share my blueprints with other people. That's something, I guess. Not what I was hoping for. Anyway, here's my creator code if you want to put a copy of Woodman in your own village. Definitely send me a screenshot on Twitter or Discord if you do. Links are in the description below. I get another house designated to be built, but I'm a little disappointed that I still don't have more materials. Where is this red wood? How do I get it? Do I need to be... Yeah. <sighs> Patient? I go to sleep in my new house and wake up in the morning to mail. There's apparently a fishing tournament today. But, unfortunately, an update came out that broke my save file, and I will have to start over from the beginning again. Such is the price of playing games in pre-early access. Overall, Hoko Life seems like it's on a good track to become a great game. The visual style is really beautiful, and the music and sound design are lovely as well, although some audio controls are desperately needed in the settings. I'm definitely intrigued, and I'm definitely going to keep playing. Some bits of the game do need some work, some of it's just bugs and balancing. There probably shouldn't be infinite wood outside the workshop. Either the trees should not respawn, or they should regrow only once per day, or they should be immune to chopping them down. And obviously the price of the bridge should be dependent on the materials used to make it. Not that I'm complaining, mind you. I think my biggest complaint is with the stamina bar for running. Why is it there? The days are so long and time passes so slowly that there's no reason whatsoever to limit how fast you can move. And besides that, you have infinite energy to do things like cutting down trees and breaking rocks. In similar games like Animal Crossing and Stardew Valley, you can run forever if you want to with no limitations. It feels to me like someone on the development team really liked the stamina meter in Breath of the Wild and wanted to remake it for Hoko Life, but there's just no reason for it to be there. There's a reason for the meter in Zelda. Your stamina has to be limited because stamina management is a critical aspect of the game, but there's none of that here. It just limits you for the sake of limiting you, and it's pretty annoying after a while. I'm sure someone worked really hard to implement that meter, but honestly, I hope they get rid of it entirely. Set the code for it aside for a future project where managing energy is actually relevant. Other critiques are that the days are just too long, and could probably be reduced by about half without impacting the slow pace of the game. The constant prompts to move and pick up items are a little annoying, and I'd like them to be hidden unless you enter a building mode which reveals them. And one last thing, I'd like to see some default design recipes. Like, it's really cool that I can design a bridge from scratch and make it look however I want, but it would be really handy to just have a basic default one you could make without having to spend ages in the designer. I suppose the computer that I just unlocked at the shop might give me access to simple designs made by other players, which I can make quickly, but since you need a creator code to find such designs, I don't really have access to that just yet. On a similar note, I'd like a way to save blueprints that I've made so I can remake them later without having to copy an item in my inventory. Which, again, it's possible is already in the game via that computer, but I haven't had a chance to try it. That's about it for my first impressions of Hoko Life. If you're looking for an Animal crossing light game to play on PC, this one's probably the closest you're going to get. But it definitely still has a long way to go before it's finished. If you go for the early access version to support the development, just be prepared to encounter a lot of bugs and balance issues until the game is finished and polished up. That's it for this video. Thanks to the developers for letting me try the game, thanks to my patrons for their support, and thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, and sign up for my Patreon if you can, because these animal villagers aren't the only ones being crushed by capitalism over here.